Hi there, and welcome to Military Histories, a podcast from York Army Museum. Each week we share an interview from the Royal Dragoon Guards audio archive. Throughout May and June we will be sharing interviews with World War II veterans. You can find more details about the Royal Dragoon Guards oral history project in the show notes. If you want to find out a bit more about our museum, there are links to our website and social media channels in the show notes too. In this week's interview you can hear General Sir Robert Ford talk about joining the regiment in 1943, training for D-Day, experiences during World War II in France and beyond, and his service after the war. The general served from 1943 to 1969. Thanks for listening, future episodes will drop every Friday. The object of this interview is to be interviewing uh, General Sir Robert Ford, uh, henceforth to be known as Robert, uh, with myself, Eric Stockley, for the Royal Dragoon Guards Oral History Project. It's the 23rd of July, uh, 2013. Robert, perhaps you could um, just give us a very brief uh, resume of your army career, and could you please start with your date of birth? I was born on the 29th of December 1923 and I joined the regiment when they just moved to Heveningham Park from Keesley in Yorkshire in um, early 1943. Now the regiment had just been told, but I missed this, uh, in a cinema in Keesley and behind closed doors they'd been told that they'd been chosen to do the assault on Europe and that um, they were going to be equipped with a brand new secret weapon called a DD tank, dual drive tank. Um, and so having had all that information, we moved to Heveningham Park because from there we had a, a lake called Fritton Lake on which we could receive all these amphibious tanks, Valentines as they then were, and start training on them. So that happened, it must have been in, I suppose, March 1943, yes, round about that. Right, so you, so, so you were just starting your training then in, in this lake? I was just starting and I joined Sea Squadron and I was reserve troop leader for 5th troop because by then all the troops uh, troop leaders' jobs had been filled up and each troop was getting a reserve, obviously anticipating casualties, and I became the reserve for 5th Troop, uh, Bob Gould, do you know, I think it was 4th, I moved to 4th Troop, no, I moved to 4th Troop, uh, and uh, that's right, and Bob Gould, who I knew well, was the uh, troop leader, hang on. But then I was troop leader. I can't think what happened. I'm confused. Anyway, we started training, and we started training on the lake uh, with this piece of equipment which was very difficult to control. And we had all together about a year's training. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started as individual tanks going into the water, then learning to uh, maneuver it, and then as a troop, and so on. And then we did it in the dark instead of in the daylight, and the training went on and on. And the worst part of the training, and the bit I remember more than anything else, was the fact, of course, we had to learn how to get out of the tank if it sank. Right. Yes. And so we learned. We had naval operate naval instructors coming to us who taught us how to use a modified Davis escape system, mm -hmm. which is a system they use in submarines. And uh, we, we used to do this in uh, Yarmouth open air swimming pool very early in the morning, about six o'clock in the morning. And um, we started off, we had six lessons, we started off with the, getting in at the sh shallow end and walking down with weights on in all your old tank suits, we didn't have tank suits, we had denims I'm afraid, mm. no tank suits in existence then. And you walked down, the water came up over you, getting used, and then you had to jump in and so on. And um, I always remember that uh, another troop in, in Sea Squadron was visited by the Brigadier doing this, 
and the brigadier looked at it and he said, six lessons to learn that, so you can learn it in one. And he said, give me the equipment, and we fitted him up with the equipment, and he jumped in the deep end and he passed 13 out. <laughs> had to be rescued, uh, had to be rescued by the two Royal Naval uh, uh, guys on the side. And then the final thing was, of course, that was unpleasant, was they dug a hole, they put a tank in the bottom, about 20 feet deep or so, and uh, we all had to go into our positions in the tank, uh, and then they opened the water at the top and the water poured in on us. We had to stay in the tank, in our positions, until the water rose to the top, and then we had to do an evacuation practice, which was that the commander kicked the driver, that meant he must get out. You then tapped the gunner on the shoulder and he was the next one to go. The operator was number three, and in true naval tradition, the but commander was last. The captain well, of the ship, yes. It looked all right down in a, in, a, in, a, in a hole full of still water, but it didn't work when we went out to sea. But however, that's another story. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we did that and then we moved uh, down to the south coast. We moved to Scotland in the meantime to do some shooting. We still had Valentines. We knew we were going to get Sherman DD tanks, but they hadn't been produced by then. Right. Mm. Hadn't come off the production line. So we did all our training in Valentines. And then we came to the big... Oh, no, no. Then I left. I left the regiment. I was sent away to become a trained as intelligence officer. And I came back. And that was when I joined um, Fist Troop as, a, as, a, as, a, as an extra troop leader. It's, I've got that slightly wrong. That's, okay. that's was, okay, that can be sorted. I was a troop leader, but that's all right, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a minor detail. And um, I came back in time for the big exercise. Uh, God, I've forgotten the name of it now, in Studland Bay. Right, I was going to ask you about that, yes. In Studland Bay. And Studland Bay was a... a, a represented uh, the beach on which we were going to land in Europe. We didn't know it was Normandy, of course. Mm. Um, and it was a big exercise watched by uh, uh, the King, by the Supreme Commander Eisenhower and by Monty. They had a great specially built concrete shelter which uh, could resist the shells which were coming in from mm -hmm. the Navy. It was a live firing exercise. And um, I remember we this story is well recorded. It in is fact, recorded, yes, yes. There is an entire Sky program on it, which I did about 15 years ago. I don't know whether you want this or not. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, just to say that um, I was going to ask because I live near Studland. Yes. Uh, and, there was a, and there was a memorial stone yeah, there to the four seventh to the yes. Mm. So I was going to ask if part of your training was going to be Studland. Yes, it was. I mean, and if, if you want to hear about it, I mean, I can tell you, because this is quite fresh in my memory because I've done the whole thing for Sky Television. Yes. If it's on Sky then well, it will be you will, have, you'll we'll be able get, to get the We'll have to get the program. We'll get the program from Sky. Well it was, yes. Yeah. We'll get the program from Sky. They will they will know what yes, we're talking about. Yes, I see. About. Yeah. Fine. because uh, I was lucky I mean we, we did the exercise, it's far too rough. The, the plan was we were launched from our landing craft five thousand yards out. Um, and then we had to swim. And we had to get to the beach at H minus five. H minus five being five minutes before the infantry landed. And because it didn't work, the sea was rough, and uh, my tank was sunk. Um, and uh, uh, it went down 20 feet, which I now know because it's a diving um, mark for subaqua training. Okay, so it's still there. It's still there at this mm. very moment, it's still mm. there. So far out, it isn't yeah. a danger to shipping. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get out and I was picked up in the dark and eventually by the Navy um, and uh, I watched the rest of the exercise from the bridge of the destroyer right. on which I'd been hauled out but sadly all my crew were drowned. They weren't, they didn't get Bob out. Bob Gould yeah. and, and all, all of them were all drowned, yeah. Oh dear, mm. right. Which was tragic. Um, uh, so that's that. I don't know where you want to go from there. Well let's move on to, to D-Day. Uh, and, and to the D-Day landings yes. uh, and to any exercises which or to any operations which might have taken place. Were you there when they crossed the Seine? 
Oh, oh you're long before. I was there all the time. You stayed, yeah. once you're back to the regiment, you I stayed with the regiment. I never left the regiment from 1943 to 19, uh, 1948. Right, OK. So, so let's, let's deal with that part then, between 42 right. and 48. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, I dealt with that part up to... Uh, that was in April the 4th, that exercise I described mm. was in April the 4th, 1944. Right. And we, of course, went over, as everyone knows, on June the 6th, yeah. 44. And uh, between the end of that exercise, uh, which was such a disaster, it was tragic actually, and I just divert a second to tell you that one of my crew was a chap called Corporal Park. And, of course, when the crew were killed, drowned, their next of kin couldn't be told how they'd been killed. Right. Because the presence of the amphibious tank was top secret and mustn't be revealed. So, in the telegrams that they got in those days, they were just said, died on exercise. And then it was planned that after we'd landed and the existence of this equipment mm -hmm. was available, that the squadron leader, who was called Michael Bell, would write to each of those who'd been killed on the exercise right. and explain mm -hmm. to the next of kin. Well, Michael Bell was killed before he could write any letters. Mm -hmm. And so the letters never went. And I just mention this because many, many years later, when the internet had begun and the Curie Club had been formed by... Um, no, no, I know his name so well. Charles, Vincent Charles? Mm -hmm. Simon mentioned him yesterday. Yes, no, I mean, I've got it written down. I know him very really well. I it's, in the it's my old age, I'm afraid. Mm. Uh, that I received a telephone message one day, and this was in two, the year about 2000. Mm -hmm. We were talking about 1944. Uh, to say that the widow of Corporal Park had got in touch with the regiment on the, through the internet. Mm -hmm and that could anyone help her to know how her husband died. She had never, ever oh, that's been awful. told. That's awful. That wasn't that terrible. That's 56, so, years. 56 um, years later. The chap, mm. Cecil Newton, Cecil Newton, who ran the crew, so rang me, mm. and he said, well, you were there. He said, you're the only one left who was. He said, well, will you break the news? I said, yes, I'll give her a ring. She lived mm. in uh, North Yorkshire. And so I rang her. I'll never forget this. And I got her on the end of the telephone. And I said, well, now, I said, you, you know, it's a long, long time ago. And I'll just tell you exactly what happened. Mm. And I told her how he drowned. Mm. Um, and that his body was never recovered. Right. Never recovered. Mm. Uh, and that he is uh, therefore commemorated in the um, big um, uh, cemetery in Surrey, the name of which I've now forgotten, an enormous one, with all those who died mm. uh, and bodies were never recovered and we don't know and, and, and don't know where they died, mainly SOE agents and people like that. And he's on, on the list there. And she said to me, I'll always remember, she said, Well actually I'm of course I married again. I mean I was a young girl, mm. married to Corporal Park and I married again. And then my second husband died fairly recently, and this is, this is why I'm sort of inquiring now. And she said, I'd like to see it. So I said, well, come down. And she came all the way down with a friend who drove her. And, uh, and uh, I took her to this cemetery and the memorial on which her husband's name was inscribed, and the yeah. date of death, and so on. And uh, she was wonderful about it, she was very touched. My wife and I took her, uh, and she was very understandably very touched. And then she said, and then I told her we were going to unveil a memorial in Studland Bay yep. the following year. And she said, I'll come. I said, God, so I said, what age you want? Because Corporal Park was older than me, and she was older than, well, older than me. Um, anyway, uh, she came, we entertained her, she came to the unveiling of the ceremony, 
uh, and uh, I think I was the only one who was there who was actually took part in the exercise. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us we could find any of the soldiers. I don't think mm -hmm. we could find them. I think, but my memory is very poor. And she was a wonderful woman, and I've kept in touch with her ever since. She's still alive in her home. Uh, of course, she's not known as Park because of her second marriage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I regret to say, oh God, I knew it so well. Uh, anyhow, I, we exchanged Christmas cards, and we did last Christmas. Uh, and she must be now 94, 5, mm -hmm. I should think. Well, these Wonderful. are the human interest stories, of course, Wonderful. which yeah. um, which this is all about. Quite. So, so thank you for sharing that. That was uh, uh, just quite touching. To it. Mm. Yeah, we rem remember that. Mm. I just wish I could remember her name. Oh, well, that's OK. That's God, okay. I know it so yeah. well. It's just gone. I've heard names don't come back to me now very easily. They come back to me several hours later. Yes, you'll probably wake up in the morning and think to yourself, oh, that's the name. <laughs> OK, so let's go on to D-Day, shall we? Yes, well, then D-Day, of course, came, and um, I was then in RHQ. We were all in tanks, had mm. four tanks. Shermans had been delivered, of course. We'd been to Linny Head, fired them, all the mm. rest of it. Were the Shermans amphibious? Uh, yes, the Sherman, two squadrons. Now, what happened was that the 17-pounder was introduced to the regiment um, because they realised then that the Tiger and the Panther tank could out-shoot us anywhere. Yeah. And so the 17-pounder, which had been designed as an anti-tank gun originally, uh, uh, one um, uh, uh, tank per troop was given um, a 17-pounder. Having been given a 17-pounder, the barrel was so long it couldn't be in a DD tank because the canvas screen, I haven't described, I imagine someone's yes, done all yes, that. Yes, they've got the, the tank busy and they've got some... Yeah, they've got all that. Yeah. I know they've got it all, yeah. Uh, so we had a proportion of the regiment uh, changed and then um, it was decided that um, B and C squadrons would be the only amphibious ones and not have 17 pounders. Right. And A squadron would have the 17 pounders. And come in later. And come in, come in later. Yeah. And, and uh, that was an hour later, actually. Mm. Um, and uh, so B and C uh, went on their landing craft, the, the original plan to be launched 5,000 yards out from the beach. But of course, by then we'd learned the lessons mm. of the exercise which we'd had. And we, unlike the Americans, put a senior officer, a captain, second commander of the squadron, a captain on the main, on the uh, com naval commander's ship, and he had authority to tell the naval commander not to uh, launch the, the uh, DD tanks if it was too rough. Right. Because yeah. the view was it was far better that we got there late than not got there at all. Well, that's, that's a good... And that seemed to be a very sensible solution. It was indeed. And so on our beach, which was Gold Beach, as against um, another beach where the 13th, 18th launched, they had a calmer water in that beach and they were able to launch and did. Mm. But we didn't launch at all. So the net result was the landing craft had to run into the beach and then lower the, uh, the, 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 the bows and then the tanks which had been waterproofed, mm -hmm. that in itself was a hell of a job. I can imagine. Uh, it took four days at first to learn how to waterproof a tank, mm. and you were covered in boss stick, and it was a ghastly job. Anyway, um, so that was what happened on the day, and on my case, uh, like, uh, better I keep to my own story, um, I uh, went on to the LCT last at Southampton, which meant I come off first, yes. because you went in reverse. And um, when we came in, we didn't receive the code word, say launch, which was a code word. So we knew we were going into the, into the beach, thank God. Mm. And um, my um, skipper on the LCT, we had five vehicles on board. I was the only tank because all the crews were mixed. I had a medical half trap behind me. And, no, I think there were two tanks, another tank. I don't know who it was and I can't remember. And I was the first one. And... Um, as we came in, it was very necessary to get the angle of the bows right so that when the tank came off the landing craft, 
the bows of the tank, which were, uh, the top, which was unwaterproof, of course, mm. didn't go underwater. And so we had to get the angle right. So the uh, young, very young lieutenant in charge of my area sent up his number two, who was a midshipman, young chap about 17, 18, mm. to stand on the bars with a pole to work out the depth. <laughs> and as we came in, this poor chap was shot dead. Right. Um, and he fell into the water. That was the first casualty I actually saw. And the chap fell straight into the water. So the, the uh, captain then just rammed the ship up, up on, on the beach. Mm. Um, and uh, I piled off. By then, there was a lot happening on the beach because I, I was about, um, it was about eight plus nearly an hour. So there were quite a, people got, quite a people on the infantry had got to the top of the beach. That was the Green Hards and the East Yorkshire. They were at the top of the beach. There were at least three tanks burning who were um, um, uh, Royal Engineer Avery's. Right. Mm. Uh, from, a, from an anti-tank position which we knew about, which was firing defilade down the beach from, from a pillbox. And we knew all about that, and it's supposed to have been bombed by typhoons and shelled by the Navy, but it didn't make any difference, the chap was still working. And he got the first three tanks that landed. And then um, some brave chaps from the East Yorkshire Regiment stormed the thing. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so by the time I came up the beach, uh, there was no, no fire yeah. coming from the, from, from the flanks. It had been taken out. Yeah, yeah it had been put out. And so I then came off the beach, went through the minefield, I knew it. We practiced this on models, I should explain all that. I mean, every, the colonel took every squadron leader through his task several times on the model. Squadron leader took all the troop leaders. The troop leaders took every man in their crew mm. through the whole thing. So we knew it backwards. That's the idea, through. isn't it? Mm. And the great thing was mm. that I landed on the beach within 50 yards of where I was supposed to. It's not bad having gone across the channel. It's not bad. Uh, no. Not bad at all. Uh, of course, the, 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 the sea was packed with shipping. I haven't described any of that. No, we don't need uh, to. I'm here, we don't need <laughs> to. We know all about that. And um, uh, anyhow, I went off and I went to the rendezvous, which was a place called the House with the Circular Drive, of which I've still got my original photograph here. And there I met up with the second in command of the regiment, eventually the colonel of the regiment arrived and the and the RHQ troop leader. And then we formed up from there and started moving up towards Crewe with uh, A Squadron just ahead of us. And that was D-Day, that was the beginning of D-Day. And right. then of course, sadly in the afternoon, we had quite a lot of casualties, quite a lot. Some from, from the Navy, I regret to say. 16 inch from HMS Rodney, they landed on troop leaders' O group, which was happening. Mm. Uh, well, it was a squadron leader's O group, but they missed the squadron leader, Jackie Girls, and they killed two troop leaders. Oh dear. Uh, and mm. um, we started having quite a few casualties. And then we'd go on, we went on, I can't remember very much. I remember that night, um, a chap called Philip Verdin, who was commanding the had already lost one eye on a training exercise through trying to throw a, um, a, a smoke grenade out of the top of a tank and it bounced on the on the <coughs> and came back and got, took out his eye. Poor chap, old Philip. I'm quite mad he was. Uh, and um, uh, so, and I remember the, 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 we, we got together and the, the echelon came up, we refueled, re ammunitioned. And that was the end of D-Day, really. Good. Mm. Okay, so um, you then continued, say, through the war, mm. uh, and I um, understand that it was at Bremerhaven, the regiment was at Bremerhaven? Yes, we finished up at Bremerhaven, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we lost a man, I think, at 8 o'clock in the morning on the final day, which was terrible. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, we were then told, we've got to clean our tanks. I don't know what the tanks were like by then. We had... I can imagine. Used t extra <laughs> tank tracks had been welded on the side to give us mm. extra protection. Everything had to come off. Mm. And the LAD had to work all night 
and then we had to scrub the tanks down, and then we had to paint them all. Right. And we all sat down and we had to pay much to our dissatisfaction, may I say. And we painted all these tanks because we were going to do a victory march through Bremen. Right. And it was very necessary we should do it so that the Germans could see we had won the yes, war. Yes, yes, yes. And so all the tanks that were still operating uh, were painted and then we did this parade and then... Um, well, then we did the parade. I, I can't remember very much about it. So we did it. So, so let's look at the... How did your perception of army life change, if it changed, uh, from a war footing to a peace footing? Ah, very sudden. Well, the first thing that happened was, after we'd done this victory parade, a matter of days, we were called together by the corps commander and he told us, I can never forget this, he told us that we'd been selected to do the assault on Japan, to repeat the Normandy assault. That was rather unfair. And he couldn't believe it. I can tell you, if that general expected he was going to get some applause or just something, he was yeah. dead wrong. Yeah. It was just dead silence. All we wanted to do was to get home. Get home. And um, uh, anyhow, I was then sent off on a Japanese course for four weeks, in four weeks to learn Japanese at Cambridge University, which was a lot of good. I learned nothing, I had a damn good time at Cambridge University, but I didn't do any work <laughs> at all. I will edit that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then we moved back to England, we mm. moved on to the race, Newmarket race course. All right, yeah. And we had set up tents on Newmarket Race Course. Uh, this was to before we were going to go aboard a ship at Liverpool to be shipped out to near Japan. So the plan was still ahead going on then? Still going on then, because it was before August when the mm. nukes came down. And um, and we set off and we went to Liverpool. And this was, this was rather uh, 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 unique. When we got to Liverpool, um, there was a mutiny. And what had happened was, it was no one in the full seventh, I can tell you, but it was all the individual reinforcements who'd come home after having done a minimum of three years, mm. been given about six weeks leave, and then were going to go back again right. to their regiments in the Far East. Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of them, about 200, refused to go. Right. And so, I'll never forget this moment, um, because they were at the bottom of the gangplank with their leaders, I don't know who the leaders were, mm. saying, we're not going to go, we're not going on board. And the orders came down that we were to uh, be armed with rifles, fixed bayonets, and that we were to move forward in column abreast mm. and to force them up the, the gangplank. Right. If necessary, be anything our own soldiers. How did you feel about that? Well, I'll tell you. The, reg the good old Force Seventh, I mean, the discipline was always absolutely wonderful. Mm. I think mainly because we were a great regiment of, of camaraderie. Mm. It was from, from Colonel to bottom trooper, there was a special, in my humble opinion, mm. there was a special feeling in the old Force Seventh. And I hoped, I was, a I was a troop leader, back to mm. being troop leader, and I had my troop and I lined them up, and I was one of the front, front uh, troops mm. to do this. Yeah. And we, we're not used to using rifles anyway, and certainly not <laughs> bayonets. Yeah. I've never been trained with a bayonet. <laughs> well, I had as a recruiter, mm. I mm. um, And we started moving forward, and as we got halfway towards them across the dockside, uh, they all, they all, they all uh, uh, lost their nerve, except up. for the leaders. Mm. And you know, the leaders, I am told, were arrested by the military police who were present, and I believe they were hanged. Right. But I'm yeah. not certain about that. Well, that's normally the, it's just death yes. penalty. That used to be the death penalty for mutual. It was a death penalty, yeah. yeah. I don't mm. think they were shot, but I don't know. I think, I think so, and I do not, I mean, I don't know about no. that. No. But when we went on board this ship, I'm not surprised there'd been nearly a mutiny because it was an old Liberty ship 
with no portholes, and we had in the in the bottom six tiers of bunks. Now we were not using six tiers of bunks; we were using three. Mm -hmm. But it meant that a top one, well, a top chap, had to climb up three in this hold with artificial light only, and we were going to go out all the way. It's a long way. A long way. Six weeks. That's because that must be about six weeks. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And um, and we went across the Bay of Biscay, and I always remember as all the officer got inspecting all that. It was ghastly. Uh, and then when we got halfway across the Mediterranean, the news came down that two nuclear bombs had been dropped on Japan, mm -hmm. and they had surrendered. So uh, the war was over. The Far East, Far East War was over. And so we uh, got to Suez where we were put ashore. Right. And we were told we're not going to the Far East. But we would, in the meantime, we'd go to um, Faid, which was a tented camp on the Suez Canal, some distance from Cairo. Mm -hmm. And we'd set up there and wait further orders. And so we set up there. Uh, we had no, no vehicles. The vehicles we were going to draw from a vehicle park somewhere near Cairo, that's right, and um, we had three months there, we were very pleasant, played a lot of cricket, right. uh, and, uh, and we got to Cairo, most of us, and we had a good time, and then the orders came for us to move across the Sinai Desert into Palestine, right. we yep. didn't know it, we were going there for two years. I was going to ask if you were in Palestine. Yes, mm. did two years. So you'd have been there for the 48 I, I was there the whole time, yes. Mm. I went, um, I was in C Squadron uh, with two or three other troop leaders, all of us very experienced by then. A chap called Derek Tresenster, and Mike Thompson, and the other chap, I can see his face now and his name just, just, just gone. My squadron leader was Bill Riley who'd been second in command of, well, he'd been a commanding squad at the end of the war. That's right, he'd been second in command when we landed. And uh, he was a pre-war regular, of course. And um, we then started patrolling, uh, we were allocated to Haifa. And we uh, set up a camp uh, in Haifa on uh, Mount Carmel. Right. And I did about three or four months of patrolling, looking for, um, uh, uh, looking for uh, urban Lumi terrorists and uh, the other terrorist organisation, Hagarah, I think that's right. Uh, and it was great fun, really, because we um, we used to patrol uh, Haifa at night. We used to raid the nightclubs, right. put the lights on, identify everyone. It was always great fun. Um, and to, or as a young young man, all the soldiers loved it. Uh, interrupting anyone else having a bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't have fun, you can't have fun. No, I, don't think, I don't remember ever capturing a terrorist. No. Uh, I don't think we did. And then after three months, I was suddenly told I was going to become adjutant and was going to uh, RHQ, which by then was in, can't remember, sorry, the place was gone. And the Colonel changed and Colonel Tom Barrett took over and I was his adjutant. And I did that for uh, for nearly two years. Right. Okay. So that would have brought you back then to so, back to England after that. So then that, I'd done enough abroad by then. I'd done, except for that little trip to Newmarket, I'd really done five years abroad. Yeah. And so um, I said to the Colonel, I had when I'd had to leave met a very charming girl in Oxford, and I said that um, I'd like to be stationed at home. So he fixed for me to have a posting to Monza for the cadet school as an instructor. Right. And I very happily went there and had two years there and in the end I married Jean, who was the girl I'd met at Oxford. Good, right. Uh, and that all was very happy. So that I left the regiment then and I didn't return for some time. Right. Because uh, I was posted from Mons Officer Cadet School, the regiment was still in Libya, in Tripoli. And um, I was posted to the Scottish Horse as training officer, adjutant initially, and then training officer, training major it was called. And they were a yeomanry regiment, mm -hmm. equipped with um, Valentine's. I think I'm right in saying, yes. No, it might have been, I think it was. 
I think I told them enough. And the St. Jones would be coming in about then, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. The St. Jones would be coming yeah, in right. about then. But not to the territory. Not the territory, yeah. No, no, it was before that. But we had very old equipment. Anyhow, I had great fun there, a lot of great fun teaching them. And then I passed the Staff College entrance examination, went to the Staff College at Camberley, and then from there I thought I was going back to the regiment, but I wasn't, because they then posted me to the War Office. And so, uh, first time ever, I was in a staff job. I'd never been in a staff job before, ever. Knew nothing about it. So I did two years then, and then I joined the reg rejoined the regiment at Fellingbostel mm -hmm. as B squadron leader. Right. So that would be about the same time that Simon was there. Simon Jenkins was. No, he wasn't. He, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No, his father was. He was. He was there as a child. Yes, as a child. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes, he was. And um, the commander, um, his father, uh, Steve Jenkins, had just finished his commanding officer, and we had a new one, who I knew well, um, who um, had just taken over from Chuckwa Henry Vanster Benzi, who came in from the outside and sadly hurt him, damaged himself jumping off a tank and had to be retired. And I had um, Ian Gill, who had been my squadron leader at one stage during the war, and been my best man at a wedding. All right, and so, so that was he became done. the commanding officer, and I was B squadron. Nigel Bagnall was A squadron. Nigel Bagnall was the name from the yes, past. Yes, and uh, he's dead, sadly, sadly. And um, uh, oh God, I do them all. She's gone. She's gone. Sorry, it's just gone from my mind. No, that's okay. Moment. And I was B squadron. Mm. And of course then it was the Russians who we were worried about, yeah. and we had Centurion tanks, and we trained up very hard, I can tell you, very hard training, and uh, I did two years right. as a squadron leader there, and then we moved back to England, the regiment did, to uh, Catwick. As a training regiment? As a training regiment. Right, yeah. And I left yeah. then, and went uh, back to Germany as a brigade major of a, of a, of a brigade. Um, I don't know what year we're into now. Uh, we must be getting into the 1960s, beginning of the 1960s. Oh, it must be. Well, then I came back and commanded A Squadron for two years. At Catterick? No, in Germany. Munster? At Munster. Right, OK, that's when I joined. Now, you joined there. Yes. Isn't it funny, isn't it funny? God. But I was in B Squadron. I was in yeah, B Squadron. Was uh, Nigel Bagley, wasn't it? No. I don't know who it was, anyway. Bobby Badley. Oh, Bobby Badley? Yeah. Who I saw last And LeBlanc Smith has to twice Oh, uh, LeBlanc Smith, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm done. Yes, well, that was, I was in B Squadron. And then I was promoted. It was extraordinary. Um, I, somehow I was made a Lieutenant Colonel, and I was still in the regiment. It was all very embarrassing. We had two lieutenant colonels in the regiment, yeah. and I was only commanding a squadron. And I moved on after that because I went to work for, um, as a lieutenant colonel for Admiral Montbatten in London for two years and travelled right. the world with him, briefing, I was his briefer. Uh, and then after that I came back to command the regiment, and of course then it just going to Aden. So you joined the regiment back in Aden? Uh, I it just moved in with Mike yes. Baratoff commanding it. Yeah, that would be 1965. And I took over from yeah. him. That's 1965, was it? Yeah. And we had, what, a year in Aden, didn't we, I think? We did yeah. a year's on a Yes, we came back in, in 66. And then we went straight to Omar. Oh, straight to Omar. Mm -hmm. And then I commanded in Omar until I was taken away to become, yeah, command the 7th Armed Brigade in Germany. And then I handed over to Nigel Bagnall. Mm. So you must have been in command then from 65 up to about 1968? Yes, about then. 67, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. I mean, all, all this off the cuff. Uh, no, you're doing very well. You're doing very well. So that's all that. Yeah. Um, and then I never went back to the regiment. He me as colonel, of course. Mm. Eventually. But you, you, you would have gone colonel by then. Colonel I'd, I'd gone you by then. You'd have gone by then, mm. yes. But we're not talking about me, we're talking about you. No, quite anyway, <laughs> don't matter. Oh. So that's my punting over. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's, uh, that's it. So when did you retire? Well, then... If you can say lucky, we can ever retired. I lucky, I then became um, 
Having commanded 7th Armoured Brigade, God, I must have gone. Oh, I went to, yes, I went to the staff to the Chief of Defence Staff, and then from there I was promoted Major General to command the Army in Northern Ireland. Yes, I was going to come on to that. Yeah. yeah. Now, are you happy about talking about Operation Brigade? Yeah, no, I'm sure happy. Are you sure? Yeah. Because I know there's been lots and lots of, and oh, I know right. I know that you've had lots of bad press about that. Oh, I don't worry about that. Can so, I... so what had to happen then? No, no, no. Let's 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 not go into that. Um, yeah. So, how long were you in Northern Ireland? Uh, two years. You were exactly. There for, you were there for two years. I had two years in Northern Ireland. Thoroughly enjoyed it because it was an operational setting which I liked. And you were posted to. And I was at um, I was a CLF Command of Land Forces, mm. and I was in. Um, Lisbon. Lisbon, that's right. Yeah. Lisbon. Yeah. That's right. And it was there that you commanded the uh, Operation yeah. Banner? Uh, Operation, yes, everything. Yeah. For two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that suddenly happened at the beginning. Yeah. And then a lot happened after that and got much worse after that. Mm -hmm. uh, it became quite serious. And so I where were you when Bloody Sunday took off? Were you in On Bloody Sunday, I was in, uh, in London, Day. You were in London down yes, south, you were in Lisbon. Watching it because it was a brigade operation. Right, okay. And not mine. Mm -hmm. And I was watching it there. Um, and so I saw all that. Then, of course, the inquiry came 10 years later, years later 40 years later. Then the inquiry took 40 off. 40 years yes. later. There was an inquiry then, and that yeah. was all over, quite straightforward. Uh, and then the rest of the Northern Ireland got worse and worse and worse. Finished up with four brigades there, my yes, God. Yes, yeah. And, um, and we lost, I know, I know, we lost 120 soldiers killed. Mm -hmm. And we had 400 and something wounded in hospital. Casualties, people have forgotten. I know. Uh, um, Very considerable. Yeah, uh, and Bloody Sunday was just one part of that. Oh, one bit of it. One bit of it, a very, very small bit. part of it. of it. But it got blown up out of war proportion, didn't it? Well, of course it did. Because yeah. It was political, yes. Mm. And uh, now that was all over. I mean, at that time, it just died. And I went on with my mother, I think, because we had to do this great big operation, uh, Motorman, when I got the bulk of the British Army yes. out there. Yeah. And they came out with every bit of kit they, kit they had, from bought it from Hong Kong, they bought it from everywhere, every mm. bit of kit they had. And we had um, average tanks to knock down, oh God, to lead the thing in. Uh, that's the Royal Engineer tanks, as mm. you all well know. Uh, and um, uh, this was the that was the biggest operation. It was the biggest operation since the war at that time. Yes, at that time because uh, mm. and uh, that was very interesting. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed. It. I, mean, I did enjoy it, that. Uh, very lucky. I had Chris Price as my ADC. I don't know if you ever knew him. And I had. Um, uh, that was right. Uh, and the force said, well, my own son was a troop leader in B Squadron up on the border. Because their B Squadron came out. Only one. Were you in that squadron? Yeah, there, were, there was. An, there was, was it uh, Simon was talking about there was an amalgamation squadron came out to work under the lifeguards. Ah, oh, no, before that. Simon, my Simon, that's my son, mm. he did 20 years ago, Edwin. He came out and did border patrols with, 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 with his own squadron. And I can't remember what the squadron was. Now, this would have been after my time because... I probably was, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. We yeah. Left, we, when we left Oma, we left Oma in, to go to uh, Senelaga. Yes, quite. We left, I left in February on the advance party. Yes. And the main regiment came across in about May, March time, end of March, and then everything kicked off that Easter. So we just got out, and the 17th, 21st copped it in the neck. Yes, they came in. They took over from us. We did a straight swap at Sanalaga to, yeah. to Omer, and they, yes. must, they must have copped it right in the neck because um, it was just beginning to brew. There was, there was a bubbling going on sort of underneath the surface. Yes. Uh, uh, with the be specials and all those sorts of things. Oh, yes, a lot, oh, a lot more was happening, yes. Uh, and, and, that was then. All, and that was all bubbling under the surface. Yes. We left, and then, say, the 17th, 21st came in. Yes. And that would have been in about, because I went to lower for 69, that would have been early 69. Yeah, well, oh, well of course. Yeah, uh, 69. I know, I wasn't there till 71. No, I know you weren't. No, yeah. Uh, and left in 73. 
Yes, because uh, you were, at this time, you were in um, Southampton Brigade. You were Southampton Brigade. Southampton Brigade, yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. Southampton Brigade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, oh no, we had, uh, we had uh, there were two years in all nine after Bloody Sunday. There were no casualties, I mean, to us on Bloody Sunday, there were other casualties, I mean, they were well aware. But um, we started having casualties then because they then started um, sniping from the houses and everything. Yes. And mm-hmm. we all got caught in that. At various times, and it was absolutely tra- it was very difficult for the soldiers get, uh, to stop that. But they had to go on with their jobs, mm. and um, we had riots. We had uh, had everything you can think of, major, major riots. I mean, mm. but all the snipers in the middle. Yes, See, it wasn't it wasn't the usual sort of riot. No, it was sort of more like a guerrilla. Yes, warfare, it was absolutely, sort of, yeah. and therefore, as I said, we lost a hundred. 20 or 118. That's through, yeah. That's throughout the whole army, isn't it? The whole, all the brigades that were there. That was throughout all the brigades that were there. Yeah. 400 odd mm. wounded, yes. Mm. But there were big casualties. Mm. Uh, for that time. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was that. I wonder if we could start drawing it to a close. We've been talking yeah, three certainly. quarters of an hour. Mm. Yeah, I'll uh, start know. drawing it to a close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and one of the phrases which you've said a lot of times is that you enjoyed yourself. Yeah. I love soldiering. Yes. I was very lucky. Mm-hmm. I was never wounded. I was very, very lucky. Uh, and um, soldiering was in my blood completely. Actually. Yes, because yes. it came through your father. And yes. Is your, is your son still in it, sir? My son, no, he's 20 years and he left. Right. A grandson? He now, he now works for, uh, no, I'm not a grandson, my oh, daughter. Right. Yeah. And he now works in the IT world. Yes. Yeah. Well, granddaughters, of course, can join the army now. Can't they can they? now. Yes. Not in my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, not in my. No, I was coming out of Sandhurst once, yeah. uh, and there are no girls there nowadays. Half full of girls. It is indeed. Yeah. Very different. Yes. It uh, must be a, com- a complete. <laughs> so it must be a completely different army then uh, uh, than, than when you joined. It was. Right. Totally different. And my, see, the fourth seventh when I joined it was re- almost all pre-war regulars. Yes. Because at Dunkirk, we had gone over to do uh, the BEF days, but we had, uh, I mean, no casualties really. Yeah. And so it was the old free 1939 yes. regular. Mm. I mean, every troop sergeant mm. was a regular. Every corporal was a regular. Mm. Nearly every soldier was a regular. Right, yeah. Uh, 50% were. Yeah. And um, so, so you had the old feeling of the old regular regiment. Yes. Uh, and were, did you, were you caught up or did you sign on? No, I signed on. You signed on. Okay, that's a good I, signed, I decided uh, I ran away. So, so that's all part of the soldiering in the blood, but isn't it? Yes. The, again, you talk about, uh, and you've talked about, and, and I can agree with what you were saying, uh, about the, the idea of it being a family. Yes, a oh, very much a family. Yeah. I, fa- I mean, I, st- I don't know the full sense now, obviously, which isn't the RDG. I couldn't possibly know because I've been away so many, many years, yes. 35 years. Mm. Um, although I could try and go to the occasional thing, but I did, but I can't now. Uh, and um, it's very, very much fun. Do you mind if I no, we'll, we'll, answer we'll that? Just, 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 I just answer this one. Yes. Yes. Robert's just going to answer the phone. Hello? Yes? Anthea, good morning to you. Well, then I tell you what I am doing. I'm actually talking to a historian at the moment who's come all the way for some extraordinary reason and wants to know, he wants to chat to me. Tell me why, he must find it very dull. But Anthea, I'm so pleased you've run. Well, I tell you what, could you? A little bit later, I'd like to have a chat. Okay, fine, bye. Good. Leave it there, much better. Leave it there. In case it rings again. Well, I hope not. Uh, and for the record, I'm not finding it boring. I'm finding it absolutely yeah. enthralling. <laughs> oh, okay, so we're with, as I said, we're getting very close to the end of the interview now. Uh, yes. And we were talking about the regiment being a family. Yes. Uh, it always has been, and I think it's due to, well, I mean, I suppose all families are, all regiments are, but I mean, I only know really well the fall seventh. Yes. I mean, spent my life in it. Uh, and um, I always felt we had a very special feel. But isn't that the difference between a regiment 
and something like a core, like the signals okay. or the engineers. Entirely different. Yeah. Mm. Entirely yeah. different. Yeah. And I mean, we all mucked in together and we, we knew the wives and all the rest of it. And I mean, of course, the foundation of it was, was, was the sound smash. Yes. Always has been. Yeah. And it was always jolly good in, the, in, the, in oh, my days yes. in the false slip. Yeah. I hope it wasn't yours. Yeah. Um, because uh, that was, that's the real centre, yeah. focal centre of the yes. regiment. Yeah. And it was great. The Sounds Mess was always a great organisation. Yes, it really was. It's had some good fun. Super. Yeah. Some good fun in there. And the other thing, of course, you, you talked about in the war, the need for communications. Yes. Mm. And I remember Rollo Payne um, sort of yeah. emphasising that. Uh, and, um, and some of the commanding officers would go around. And if your driver yeah. didn't know what was going on, yeah. you got it in the oh, neck. Absolutely, yeah. You know, yeah. because you hadn't briefed your troop Everyone according. Everyone should be told what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Rollo, uh, that's not Rollo. Uh, yeah, I'm not Rollo Payne. No. Poor Rollo Payne. I, I haven't mentioned him. Well, he was a squadron leader. And and my CEO shortly for a short, very short time. Yeah, but he was a squadron leader with me. Yes, of course yeah. he was. So he must have been a squadron leader in Munster, mustn't he? Why would I know his name? It must be because he was in Munster when I joined. No, he couldn't have been. Yeah, no? I mean he's senior to me. One senior to me. Oh God. Anyway, no, I'm not sorry. I'm no, 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 not to worry. That, yeah. that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I I do appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for this interview. It's yeah. been absolutely fascinating. Well, I Just, hope it has. It has, uh, and I'm sure that it will give a lot of insight uh, to to people who are wanting to know what's been going on and, and what it's like uh, mm. at the sharp end. Well, I'm also very delighted that I just mentioned Sarn Smith. I could so easily have missed that, and that's fundamental mm -hmm. to the good regiment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I really sincerely mean that. Yeah. In every way. Um, no, we had, uh, and I, I, I like to think we looked after all the soldiers pretty well, as well as we possibly could. No. And because uh, in my days, after all, we half on were national service. Yes. Mm -hmm. More than half. Two thirds, I think. And then you had short service commissions coming we in. We had short well. service, well, all mixed up. Mm -hmm. And we all mixed in together, and I really yep. don't think. Mm -hmm. I like to think if it happened nowadays, it would be the same, but I. A little bit doubtful myself. I would like to think so, but uh, <laughs> but again with you, I I'm a little bit doubtful. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that the amalgamation <laughs> of the skins is an amalgamation too far. Yeah, that's that's my view, and of course there's talk now of further amalgamations oh, as well. Awful. Yeah, uh, and the iron of course is cutting right back. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, no, uh, and I now terminate the interview.